chasing the perfection, sometimes it just slowed me down because I can spend two years making a gas tank perfect, perfecting the small, tiny little detail. If you get that, it's great, but I have to keep going for the next one and the next one to move on. Maybe next time I can make better surface, better shape, better result. I like to have that goal every time. You know, that's what moves me every day. There's an old Japanese saying, Furuki wo tazunete atarashiki wo shiru. Learn from the past to know the present and the future. I really like the old stuff, like old train or old airplane or old cars, buildings and art deco and stuff like that. I just, uh, I get really attracted to those things and inspired by it. What I've always appreciated about Kano is super open-minded. You know, like taking something from a completely different discipline and how that applies to making a motorcycle or making, you know, a sculpture, this or that. It's all applicable. First, I got into uh, sheet metal shaping. I think it was 15 years ago. I tend to uh, get attracted to the shape that it has round and but pointy, edgy, squareness. That it's not instead of just all round, round, round. It's just, I like the mix of things. I think it's okay, there's a round area, nice contour line, and there's a straight line, pointy, angular, that I think that's that complement each other. I think it's all about visual balance. There's a lot of stuff that influence work. Like I said before, it catches my attention, and I just look at it and I, I the, think about why it catches my attention, and it may, Try to think of how do I incorporate that design idea, design concept behind it, that it's turning into my thing. Anything like a furniture or train or cars or sculpture or building is just anything that walk around and see see something like oh, that's pretty. Look at that. It's always about the bikes running and stopping and going and, you know, performance. And then, obviously, the ne next phase is the style. From the fenders to the oil tanks to the gas tanks, a lot of the fabrication and the, the sheet metal work, you know, it's really more like a sculpture kind of approach or a craftsman um, where you're going to get some nice lines and some nice flow. Kano seems to work more with, you know, the soft or organic type lines and any kind of hard, um, hard lines that you might see on some other styles. It's interesting just to kind of see here's a guy who's, you know, basically 20 years in the New York City motorcycle game, 
still coming out and being creative and keeping the ideas fresh and kind of moving along, you know, with the industry and staying, um, you know, contemporary with what's happening in the custom bike world. See this? That's shape, right? You see the shape? If I flip it over, that's the other side. I was born in uh, Japan, grew up in a town called Fukuoka. My dad has a bunch of scooters and Yamaha XS650, uh, Triumph, Honda CB400. He always had this a little room in the house that has uh, motorcycles and work on the motorcycles. Not like building crazy custom anything, he would just uh, work on it to fix things. I remember the first time that my dad took me on the ride. I think it was we were on the way to the doctor's appointment or something. I was sick or something, and um, you know, I was really scared. I think I was like seven or eight, something like that. That was the first memory. The XS650 has a big, long exhaust pipe in the rear, and then somehow I think I was trying to get on it. Or touch it, it got burned on my calf. And I just, you know, I remember that I was really scared and I, I remember I had to stay away from the motorcycle. I think I was like 13, 14. My dad gave me, uh, me and my younger brother, uh, Yamaha T1125 that he used to ride. It's like a dirt bike. At that time, we were living in a house that has property. It's like a mountain area. First, I rode and I felt like I was Superman. I could go up and down, jump, or you know, stuff like that. I felt just something special about a motorcycle. Fukuoka University. It's in my hometown. And my major was history. And my original intention was to be a high school teacher. I thought it was my secure future. Looking back, I think it was wrong motivation. So passion wasn't there. At the same time, I had a part-time job in a ramen noodle restaurant or supermarket. So then I just kind of started to hang around the bike shop in between times. So I started missing classes. Sometimes I hang out all night and wake up in the morning and I just miss the class and, you know, oh, well, well, let's go to the bike shop. The bike shop had a bunch of uh, hot bike magazines or uh, Easy Riders, and I see the custom bikes in America, and I find out that the uh, school in Arizona, it's called uh, MMI, Motorcycle Mechanic Institute. It was a little, little article in a Japanese magazine that a friend of mine showed me. At that same time, I wanted to build motorcycles, and, but I didn't know where to start. I just had an apprentice and ship and bike shop, and, work a few other part-time jobs. So then when I saw that, and then um, maybe, maybe I go to America. I wanted to get out of my hometown there anyway. I, I wanted to go somewhere after college. Um, so maybe this is a perfect excuse to get out of my hometown. But I don't know how to get to the school, how to get in touch with the school. Back then, there's no internet, and I didn't speak English. I had um, the job in this um, car manufacturing plant uh, in the Mitsubishi assembly line. Yeah, and uh, it was pretty good money, a boring job. 
is just doing the same thing every day in the assembly line. So I did that for two years to save enough money to come to the United States. So now that original template, you can see, I cut it a little bit bigger, and also I stretched it, so of course it gets bigger too. So it's okay, because I can trim it. I started in my mind in 98. I was terrified. Didn't know what to say. Didn't understand what the teachers and anything like that. It just, everything was puzzle. All I had to guess, I had a tape recorder all the time, recording the whole class. And I would go back and listen again and, and try to make sense of it from the textbook and then write down from the whiteboard and stuff like that. At the same time, it was fun. It was a new challenge. In the end, it gave me a really strong foundation of experience and knowledge of motorcycles. After MMI, I sent out a bunch of resumes to a bunch of dealership, mostly in California area, Arizona, West Coast area, and one in Brooklyn, New York. Name Brooklyn just stood out. And the dealership in Brooklyn is the only one that got back to me. So I just put everything in a U-Haul truck and I drove from Phoenix, Arizona to Brooklyn, New York. Well, I got the job. They don't pay much, but it's, at least it's my first job that I was really excited. I feel like finally I put my foot on the door of custom motorcycle, even though just a dealership, but still, this is a stepping stone. Regular mechanic, just service and repairs, and I would change mirrors, <laughs> put a chrome cover on, or regular dealership job. I did that for 10 months, but I needed more. I wanted to get into custom bikes and I wanted to do fabrication or at least be in that kind of environment. So I picked up Yellow Page and looked for a bike shop. And as I picked one, it's called American Dream Machine. It was in Soho, Manhattan. It's just basically just a regular mechanic. And you know, first job would be sweeping floors and taking trash out or push bikes out, push the bike in. It's the same thing that I did in the bike shop in Japan. It's, I had to kind of prove myself. But it's, it was really exciting to get in that kind of a bike shop. That's where I met uh, my mentor, Indian Larry. I didn't know who he was. I have heard of his name, or I have seen his bike on a magazine. I put that together after we met. 2001, the bike shop lost the lease to the space, so they had to move. But they found the spot it's in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. So we moved shop to uh, Williamsburg, North 14th Street, and uh, changed the name to Gasoline Alley. Well, he'd be working on the one lift, I'd be working on the other lift. So we, it's not like we were working together on the same bike at the same time. It's, that, it's not like he's showing me did, do things every day. Okay, let me get stuck in some job that I can't figured it out or can't get the stuff off or can't put it back on or anything like that. He would, let's do this this way and just let's get it done, kind of a, like a mentality. Yeah, so of course I learned a lot. Not stuff that I learned in the school, it's learned from the real world. That was a really important time on my career, that's for sure. <laughs> Mm. 
we moved the shop from the Soho to Brooklyn, Williamsburg, and it was still owned by a different guy. Then that Jesse James stuff and all TV stuff and happening, and it, Larry kind of got into that whole TV scene, and so that's when and uh, he kind of took over the shop. Now he owned by Larry instead of owned by somebody else. So he took over it and named it Indian Larry. First, I, I was the only employee for him. That was 2004. Then tragedy happened. He passed away the same, same year. year for me too. Five months before and my dad passed away. Yeah, so it's uh so I lost like two guys that it's that kind of figure, you know? My father and uh, my mentor and then my boss. I was there. It was a bike event. He was doing a stunt for the audience. And I was at the table selling t-shirts. I remember he was pushing the bike out. Oh, okay, I'll see you later. And I heard that he fell and he was, uh, I was told that he was getting airlifted. Ooh, I, I didn't think it's too serious at that time, but ended up that was the uh, end of it. Larry had a bright future ahead of him, finally. You know, all this time that he was building choppers and that he had up and down, I believed that he was, finally he was getting recognition what he had deserved. Yeah, it was a really tough situation. I kind of took over with other partners to, to carry on under his name to keep the uh, limelight over his name. I had to pick one memorable bike that it's, uh, we did. Was the uh, very first one, it's called Brooklyn Beatnik. The engine, the, it was mix of panhead, knucklehead, and a shovelhead bottom, it's totally not fake or anything, it's just real panhead and real knucklehead on the top and onto corn shovel bottom end. It was all mixed engine and bike, bike run great. It's still my favorite too, back from those era. If there's a stage in my life that makes me who I am, there's a time in Japan growing up with my parents and friends and the environment. And then came here and met those guys. That's another stage that molded me. And then there's a time that I'm on my own. I think it was 15 years ago. I started pounding metal just without knowing what I'm doing. I bought the English wheel and hand hammers and it was just banging metal, pounding metal, try to make a shape and yeah, of course, uh, results are disaster. Back then, there's no like a video on YouTube or internet that you can look up to find out the way it's, and also didn't know anybody to ask. 
it was try and error and a lot of scraps and a lot of fuck ups and yeah, that was a challenge that I have to figure it out on my own with the you know books and a lot of late night and yeah. First, you have to have a vision of what the shape is going to look like, and it starts from the flat sheet metal and cut out and start to make it stretch, shrink, and you know, cut and trim and bend. And it's not like come from the one big sheet metal. It just cut it out and bend it and then set it up and make a template again. And it's like a big puzzle. There's no one simple method to make the three-dimensional sculpture. It's just, I have to use all kinds of things. You have to be really creative to do the sculpture. It's easy to make a first one. It's challenging to make another part to match it. In another word, it's okay, you wanted to make a two pieces that come out this way and compound curve. And it's harder to make another one to make it exactly the same. Yeah, that is always the hardest part. Kano comes from like a pedigree of New York City bike builders. I mean, you know, Indy and Larry, everyone knows him. He's like a world famous guy, Paul Cox, guys like Knucklehead Steve and Fritz, you know, Spritz by Fritz. And then, you know, there was Robert Pratke and those folks. And then obviously, you know, all that cross pollination through that, you know, TV time when it was, you know, the biker build off early 2000s. So these guys got all, all exposed to you know, all these other styles from, you know, maybe it's Billy Lane or Kendall Johnson or Jesse James on the West Coast. I mean, you know, there's so many builders out there and it was so popular when Kano was coming up after MMI in the late 90s, you know, to go out and see all these major shows and festivals and events, you know, around the country from Sturgis to Laconia to all the kind of a little discreet events, kind of like what Mama Tried is now, where it's a little more subculture of the subculture. Mama Tri seems to me it's their way to celebrate the motorcycle culture and their own vision of motorcycles in multiple ways. And, uh, and I love the uh, location too, it's the middle of America. I'm really excited to be part of it. First of all, I, I love how they do it and how they present themselves. I know they pay attention to what goes in. It's not only just a chopper, not only a racer or anything like that. It's just a little bit of everything for everybody. And they found this a beautiful space last year that I was really like blown away. I've watched him over the last 10 years since we met just consistently challenge himself and try to push the work in some new directions. Not just keep doing the same thing over and over again. Not be like pigeonholed into like some style or what you're known for dictate the work. You know? His style, I feel like it's constantly evolving, which is probably my favorite thing about what he does. What I'm building is a 1968 shovel head with the uh, late 70s transmission and frame is a four-speed frame, swing-on frame. It's not choppery shape to it and that kind of goes to the rear fairing. Tank is from Japanese bike that I was inspired by it and modified it and made it from scratch and turned it into my own thing. Everybody thinks it's Harley Davidson is a chopper, but it's, it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, why not? I think I can make it look cool and unique. 
With anything, people tend to find something that works, and more often than not, you just keep working that, you know, with very small little movements in any direction. Where, like, I've watched him over the years, like, make totally different bikes, but it always feels like him. You can always see his hand in the work. To me, style is it's a byproduct of your decision-making while you're working. Like, you like this as opposed to that, but you always have to be open to try new things and see if it works. See if it pushes it somewhere else. I've been working so hard to come this far, and there's more to go, and you can't stop. Whenever I had a hard time, anything like project or customer, or I usually do more. Not fight against it, it just like change my mind to work on something else to keep moving, keep going. That is the challenge. <laughs>